Hi everybody. This video is about animal agriculture. It was initially supposed to be a big video that included animal agriculture and other questions about animals and human culture, but um, for a variety of reasons I decided to break them up into two videos. Thus far, we've explored what a welfare-based utilitarian approach to moral obligations to animals might look like, as well as what more deontic rights-based approaches might look like. In a, welfare, in a welfare framework, we focus on the capacity of at least some non-human animals to be harmed through pain and suffering. And on this model, so long as any creature has the capacity to suffer, then they're morally significant and they need to be taken into account in our moral calculus of benefits and harms. Accordingly, frivolous actions that visit immense harm on non-human animals while offering relatively small benefits are prohibited, and this probably rules out an awful lot of animal testing, as well as concentrated animal feeding operation style factory farming practices, and probably most zoos as well. However, since this is essentially sort of a moral calculus, an economic moral calculus, there are clearly going to be some cases where the benefit to be had by all who are affected outweighs the harm that are, that's done to non-human animals. It's not clear exactly where this line of too much harm to justify this much benefit is going to be here, but if a zoo treated its animals well enough, or if some instance of animal testing stood to save millions of human lives, or if animals could be raised and slaughtered for food painlessly, then these practices could be morally permissible on a utilitarian welfare approach. A rights-based approach might be able to offer stronger protections for non-human animals. After all, no matter the benefits or harms involved, few people would accept the moral permissibility of keeping humans in zoos or performing medical tests on humans against their wills, or raising and slaughtering humans for food, and when pressed for justification on this, a common coherent response is one that makes a claim about universal absolute human rights. One of the things that rights protects us against is being used as currency in a utilitarian calculus. We might approach this through the prospect of including some non-human animals as fully-fledged fully fledged persons that are protected by human rights, but it's unlikely that more than a few species or possibly even a few individual animals would qualify for this. We might additionally approach this by exploring what a comparable but distinct theory of animal rights might look like, something that could offer the same sorts of protections from being sacrificed on the altar of utilitarian benefit but would be based on something more common than a relatively rare capacity for free rational thought and ability to be a moral agent. Tom Reagan showed us that we might want to think about the sorts of rights that belong to moral patients in addition to the sorts of Kantian rights belonging only to moral agents, and suggest that maybe we ground these rights in the capacity to be a subject of a life. While a significant and potentially powerful addition to the conversation pointing us in the direction of non-human animal rights and the prospect of inherent value in animals beyond their utilitarian value, it's worth noting that it isn't entirely clear what sorts of protections these sorts of rights would offer for subjects of a life. Now notably, equal respect for individual subjects seems to not quite be enough to secure a dog a justifiable place on the lifeboat in the thought experiment that Reagan closed our reading with. In fact, Reagan seems to take it as a fairly obvious and intuitive conclusion that the dog should be the one who is not saved. He claims that coming to this conclusion does not violate equal respect for individuals, as we're in a situation where some individual is going to have to die. Reagan's principles of justice, the minimum override and the worse off principles that he proposes for these sorts of cases, tell us that in such a situation, we should seek to pursue actions that result in the least harm. And as Reagan is claiming that death for the dog is a lesser harm than death for any one of the humans, leaving the dog off the lifeboat seems to count the dog equally as an individual, while also recognizing that if some individual does have to be harmed, it should be the one who is harmed least in the available options for action. This is, admittedly, contentious, and maybe even a little disappointing from somebody who was advocating for equal respect for all subjects of a life, but it doesn't seem implausible. We need only think about the sorts of decisions that many healthcare workers have had to make in the past weeks, and many more will have to make in the coming weeks, when they decide which patients get life-saving ventilators when there aren't enough to go around. 
And this is enough to show us that these are very real moral dilemmas, and any good moral theory really should give us some direction in, in how to figure out what to do in those kinds of situations. Now, perhaps the only fair way to do this that respects all individuals equally, whether we're talking about lifeboats or ventilators, is to decide this randomly, but employing a least harm principle doesn't seem like a crazy idea either. Now, we might still have some lingering questions about why Reagan thinks that a dog's death is a lesser harm than a human's death, as well as some questions about how to apply this least harm principle in other sorts of scenarios that might pit human interests against animal interests. For example, one member of our class posted a fascinating question online about how this worse-off principle would apply to the question of animal agriculture, specifically factory farming-style animal agriculture. If what we're talking about here is the infliction of large amounts of suffering and death on millions of non-human animals in order that humans can eat the sorts of foods that they like, then it would appear that factory farming does indeed violate Reagan's Warsaw principle. And Reagan says as much elsewhere in his writings, and in fact, uh, as we'll see da Stephen Davis allude to, uh, Reagan claims that respect for animals as individuals demands that we adopt a vegan diet. The prospective harms that are visited upon livestock and agricultural systems appear to leave those animals significantly worse off than the humans would be if we had abolished such systems. But this question becomes a little bit more complicated and nuanced if we start thinking about more so-called humane agricultural practices with animals. If the animals we are raising for slaughter get to leave relatively pleasant lives up to the moment that they are killed, and they're killed in a relatively painless way, would that make slaughtering them for food morally acceptable? What if the conditions that those animals lived in were significantly better than the conditions that they would experience in the wild if there were no animal agriculture at all? Sure, this isn't the norm, and in the vast majority of animal agriculture, the animals endure tremendous suffering that's far worse than a wild existence. But what about eating animals the nice way? Enter Jeff McMahon, a utilitarian philosopher who has made a successful career writing about the nature of death and the prospective harms that it represents. At stake in his article, Eating Animals the Nice Way, is whether or not there could be such a thing as benign carnivorism, by which we mean some kind of morally acceptable form of carnivorism. And if so, what conditions would actually qualify as benign carnivorism? McMahon argues that the prevalence of the idea that there is such a thing as benign carnivorism, even amongst many animal advocates, comes down to the way in which most people seem to care about non-human animal suffering, but are seemingly less concerned with non-human animal lives. We don't want animals to suffer, but we are comparatively less swayed by the prospect that an animal's life might get cut short. McMahon thinks that this is a mistake, and he's out to correct that thinking. In order to do this responsibly, he gives us what he takes to be the best case for calling some of the more humane agricultural practices benign, which include the following points. The animals would have to have some lives that are worth living. They would be well fed, protected from predators, and allowed the free exercise of their natural instincts, and at least as well off as their counterparts living in the wild would be. Two, the animals would not have existed at all if not for the practices of benign carnivorism, and moreover, it's not just that the particular animals would not have otherwise existed, it's that far fewer animals that have lives worth living would have existed in the absence of these sorts of practices. Number three, the animals would be allowed to live a considerable portion of their natural lifespan before they're painlessly killed. Number four, although killing animals might deprive them of several years of their lives, the amount of good that they would thereby lose is comparatively slight. Number five, the significance of the loss that the animals suffer must be discounted for their relative absence of psychological unity in their lives. Number six, those that are painlessly killed are replaced by new animals with lives that are equally good. And seven, the pleasure that people get from eating the animals is, in general, greater than the pleasure these people would have gotten from eating foods that are derived entirely from plants. The major thrust of this argument seems to be that if benign carnivorism enables animals to have contented lives that they wouldn't have otherwise had, it seems like that these practices of benign carnivorism might be better for the animals as well as for the humans who get to eat them. And if that's the case, then how could such a practice be morally objectionable? Now, McMahon has some issues with some of these points, and uh, what he's out to figure out here is whether or not all of them actually do obtain in the sorts of practices that people have in mind when they talk about benign carnivorism, and if such a practice were to exist that had all of these, uh, all of the characteristics that are listed in this argument, would that sort of practice be morally permissible? So we'll notice there with uh, points four and five, 
we have the same kind of thing that we saw with Reagan. Although killing the animals might deprive them of several years of life, the amount of good that they would thereby lose is comparatively slight, and the significance of the loss of uh, the loss that the animals suffer must be discounted for the relative absence of psychological unity in their lives. Here, McMahon, like Reagan before him, seems to be making a really big concession that institutes some kind of hierarchical system of valuing of different kinds of lives, such that human lives are valued over non-human animal lives. McMahon points out that animals are not capable of so-called deep psychological suffering and enjoyment, the sorts that humans are capable of, the kinds of things that uh, we might get uh, enjoyment-wise out of achievement or creativity or deep personal relationships, knowledge or aesthetic appreciation, etc. Uh, if we're talking about the deep psychological suffering, we're talking about like, you know, existential dread and that sort of thing. The kind of dread that you might have over knowing that you're going to die someday. Both Reagan and McMahon seem to assume that animals don't really have access to these sorts of deep sufferings and, and lofty goods in part because animals seem to let, be less connected to their future selves. They don't have uh, the kinds of desires or intentions or ambitions for the future that humans have and would be frustrated by death. Now, as usual, when we see these kinds of arguments, uh, one of the first things that might pop into our minds is like, well, how are humans with severe cognitive disabilities going to fare on this kind of reasoning? Um, and it seems like they might also not be capable of deep psychological suffering or capable of, you know, the, the very high, uh, the highest kinds of enjoyment that humans can have. Um, they might also not be connected to their future selves in ways such that they have plans for their future that would be frustrated by death, um, which kind of add to an additional loss when that person is killed. But those quibbles aside, one thing that McMahon is really, really careful to point out here is that these differences in valuation between humans and non-human animals are, as he claims at least, not the sorts of things that are subjective differences in value. Of course humans are going to prize their own lives over the lives of animals, but McMahon, like Reagan before him, seems to be saying that, like, no, this isn't just a subjective valuation. Instead, these are rooted in objective, impersonal, non-sentimental evaluations of goods that have to do with the objective capabilities of humans and non-human animals. Now, maybe you agree with these points and maybe you don't, but it's difficult to argue that there isn't at least some prevailing intuition that all other things considered equal, a human life is somehow more morally valuable than an animal life. And it's notable that having made that big concession, McMahon still is out to show that there isn't such a thing as benign carnivorism. And he does that by starting to squeeze the argument in other places and hedge in where it can go. The first of these counter arguments concerns the use of terms like better and worse to compare existence and non-existence. Now we saw some shades of this when we were thinking and talking about future not yet existing people. McMahon points out that we have to be careful not to say things like to exist is better than to not exist. We can't compare non-existence to existence since non-existing things don't exist. They have no properties that can that we can compare other sorts of existing states to. And we can't really say that a non-existing individual has an interest in being caused to exist. Instead, we might have to talk in non-comparative terms like good and bad rather than better and worse to say that, for example, a life of unremitting suffering is bad and a life of pleasure and satisfaction is good, but not that really either of these things is better or worse than non-existence. Now this doesn't debunk the prospect of benign carnivorism, it just sort of specifies the justification that we might offer for it. We can't say that it's better for the animals to exist in whatever conditions that we might put them in than to not exist, but we can say that an animal's life is, on the whole, a good one, even if it ends in slaughter and prematurely cuts the animal's life short. And maybe we can even say that the goodness of this life justifies bringing them into existence, and thus the practice of raising animals for slaughter generally. But we also have to take care to note that just because it might be good to cause something to exist, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can kill it whenever we want and still say that we've done something good on the whole. For example, we would never tolerate this sort of attitude towards humans to say that, well, I brought them into existence and that's on the whole good, and so maybe that excuses uh, me ending their lives for my own purposes. Say, for example, uh, in an, uh, an example that McMahon brings up, uh, a, a hypothetical practice of organ farming, where we say that, 
we're going to bring some people into existence specifically to end their lives at a certain point and harvest their organs for other people who might need them. That seems like the sort of thing that we wouldn't tolerate. And pointing out that we're responsible for having caused those people to exist in the first place and that their lives are, on the whole, good, doesn't really justify that practice. As McMahon says, once they become persons, they have a right not to be killed. It would be irrelevant that it's good for them to exist and that they would never have existed if we hadn't caused them to exist specifically in order to kill them for their organs. But maybe this kind of objection only applies to humans and it doesn't stick for animals. After all, maybe our objections to bringing people into existence only to harvest their organs at a later date um, is wrong because it's a violation of some kind of basic human right. And maybe while animals might have some kinds of rights, maybe they don't have that kind of right and they're not protected from that kind of practice. So the argument for benign carnivorism here is a little bit squeezed, but um, it's not really defeated yet. It still seems like it might be able to stand. The real sticking point for McMahon seems to lie in this point about the pleasure that's gained by humans eating meat, and this question of what exactly is on the line when we're weighing an animal's life against the benefits that are gained by humans when they eat meat. Because it is undeniable that some benefit does accrue to humans when they eat meat. So that's on one side of the kind of like utilitarian calculus. We have the benefits that are gained by humans when they eat meat. But we have to make sure that we're evaluating this carefully here. What we're actually concerned with here is not the benefit that's gained by eating meat, but the difference between the benefit that's gained by eating meat and the benefit that's gained by eating non-meat alternatives. Now I've heard some arguments from some very enthusiastic carnivores to the tune that they enjoy eating meat far more than they enjoy eating non-meat alternatives, but honestly if we take a if we take a, like a real clear-eyed look at the difference between the benefits that are gained between those two options, it's a fairly slight benefit particularly if we're stacking that up against the benefit that would be gained by allowing the animal to live the rest of its life. And if we're thinking to ourselves like, yeah, but like human goods are better than like cow goods, so the benefit gained by allowing the animal to live the rest of its life maybe isn't that great of a benefit, keep in mind here that what we're weighing that against is the difference between the benefit that's gained by eating meat and the benefit gained by eating non-meat alternatives. And the real bulk of that difference seems to lie in a pretty base, sensuous, animalistic pleasure gained from eating things that we like. And it's notable that the cow enjoys the same kind of pleasure when it eats the food it likes, and we're looking at prospective years of a cow's life in which it's going to be able to like eat all the foods that it likes and gain enjoyment and benefit from that. So it really starts to look pretty implausible that the difference between the benefit gained by eating meat over non-meat alternatives is really that much greater than the benefit that's gained by allowing the animal to live the rest of its life. If we consider that the animal whose life is cut short is deprived years of gustatory and other kinds of pleasures for the sake of a handful of human meals, this hardly looks like a net benefit for all concerned. And we can't fall back on the goodness of the decision to bring the animal into existence in the first place as justification for taking that life away when it suits us. The decision to bring the animal into existence has, whatever the motivating reasons might have been at the time, already been made. The question about whether to take that life now is a separate question requiring a separate action that must be evaluated on its own terms. The animal already exists now, and we must ask ourselves not whether the animal should have been brought into existence in the first place or not, but whether or not we are justified in ending the animal's life. So as far as McMahon seems to be concerned, when confronted with this question of, like, is there such a thing as benign carnivorism, the answer seems to be, no, there isn't such a thing. You should go vegan. Any decision that deprives an animal of years of its life simply for the sake of a few meals worth of human gustatory pleasure is not morally justifiable. However, this does raise some questions about what it is that we should be doing with these animals if not slaughtering and eating them. Perhaps we should release them into the wild. But we recognize that if we did release all of our domesticated livestock into the wild, they would surely die a more painful death than they ever would at our own hands. After all, the wild is not a friendly place, and these animals are not equipped to deal with it. So maybe instead of releasing them into the wild for a painful death, maybe we should just euthanize them all, but don't eat them? Uh, well, that hardly seems like a good idea. It cuts the animals short, and we lose whatever sort of 
gustatory pleasure that the humans would have gotten, or nutritional benefit that the humans would have gotten in eating that. It almost seems like a like like a, a waste just to euthanize these animals and not eat them. The obvious alternative to these two very unpalatable options is that we continue to care for these animals rather than kill them or turn them loose in the wild where they're sure to die. And while this might seem like a tall order, Maybe we should note that we take on special responsibilities to care for things when we bring those things into existence, particularly if we bring them into existence in such a way that makes those things incapable of caring for themselves. As McMahon writes, it seems wrong to cause an individual that is incapable of surviving in the wild to exist, and then to abandon it in the wild. One must either refrain from causing it to exist, or else arrange for it to have the kind of care that it requires once it does. So it looks as if whether we're taking an animal rights approach or an animal welfare approach, then not only is a factory farming style of animal agriculture morally impermissible, and it should be noted that this is overwhelmingly the vast majority of meat in the United States, but it also looks as if even more humane, so-called humane, approaches to raising animals for slaughter and consumption are also morally impermissible. This is a really big deal if it's true, and the arguments don't appear to be all that faulty in any kind of obvious ways. The upshot, as folks like Singer and Reagan and McMahon argue, is that we should all be vegetarians and probably vegans too, since the production of milk and eggs is no picnic for the cows and chickens that are involved. But not so fast, says Stephen Davis. Perhaps folks like Singer and Reagan and McMahon are correct, and we do have a duty to follow some sort of least harm principle that includes harm to animals. And this means that we should act in a way such that we're limiting the number of animal deaths, at least to those animals that are subjects of a life or are sentient and capable of suffering, as much as is possible. Davis seems to at least provisionally agree with all this, but he still also seems to think that the application of a least harm principle doesn't necessarily mean that the best model of food production involves a shift to veganism and plant agriculture. And the big revelation that seems to suggest that maybe it's not concerns the way in which industrial large-scale plant agriculture involves some really intense interventions on the land. When we engage in these interventions, including things like plowing and tilling fields, there are all kinds of animals of the field that end up caught up in the mix and killed. Davis gives us a lengthy, though hardly exhaustive, list of the kinds of species at stake here, including possum, rock dove, house sparrow, European starling, black rats, Norway rats, house mouse, chuckers, gray partridge, ring-necked pheasants, wild turkeys, cottontail rabbits, gray-tailed voles, and numerous species of amphibians. All of these creatures are killed in large but uncounted numbers by the mowing, tilling, harvesting, and other interventions on the land that are part of large-scale plant agriculture. We pay so little attention to this that we don't even really have good data on exactly how many, but it's certainly a very large number. And if Stephen Davis has anything to say about it, it's enough to make us think very seriously about whether plant agriculture is any better for animals than animal agriculture is. Davis estimates that 1.8 billion animals would be killed yearly just to produce a vegan diet for Americans alone. Why do we overlook these animals of the field? Is it because they're small? Is it because they're uncharismatic? These aren't really good, impersonal reasons to disregard the moral value of an animal. And as any good animal welfare or rights advocate will tell us, the pain that a rabbit feels is on par with the kind of pain that a cow feels and a rabbit or a vole or a pheasant is no less of a subject of a life than a cow is. The alternative that's offered by Davis is to employ a pasture ruminant model as much as possible, in which grazing herbivores are used to harvest foraged plants and to convert the energy that they get from the plants, plants in turn getting energy from the sun, into meat, dairy, and eggs that humans can consume. This model requires far less intensive disruptions to the land that would kill so many animals of the field in an industrial plant agricultural model. And if this is true at the scales that Davis is suggesting, and he certainly seems to think that it is, then perhaps, yes, a pasture ruminant model is going to do better by a least harm principle than a shift towards industrial scale vegan plant agriculture. Furthermore, the larger these grazing herbivores are, the better as we can get more food per life out of them, indicating a need to shift away from things like chicken and pigs and towards larger animals like beef cows in our agricultural models. We might even want to go bigger than this. Davis cites a PETA proposal to turn to whale hunting in order to get like the most food per animal life, 
We might even turn to elephant hunting as a superior option to the slaughter of grazing cows, as we can get even more meat out of a single elephant than we could out of a single cow. And while these might seem like shocking sorts of proposals, remember the idea here is that every subject of a life, their subjectivity, their life, perhaps should count the same. And there's no reason that we should prefer killing cows to killing elephants or whales. That might not actually be true if it turned out that elephants and whales were more cognitively sophisticated than cows, and there may be as good reason to believe that that might be true. This is admittedly a pretty compelling argument, and one that I think any vegan should seriously think about if they think that the way that they're eating is um, something that brings about the least possible harm to animal lives. However, it seems like some of Davis's comparisons here might be a little bit disingenuous. For the most part, he's comparing the most ecologically friendly versions of animal agriculture to some of the least ecologically friendly versions of plant agriculture. The truth is that most of our meat isn't produced in a pasture ruminant model. Instead, it's produced in a factory farming concentrated animal feeding operation model in which we farm plants and then feed those plants to the cows, so we're actually really getting the worst of both worlds. Furthermore, it seems like a better version of plant agriculture might be something like small, low-intensity agriculture for a vegan diet, maybe even something like every citizen, or at least lots of citizens, growing their own victory gardens to produce all of their own food themselves, rather than large-scale industrial agriculture that's going to make really intensive interventions on the land that are going to kill lots of animals of the field. Davis entertains this, but dismisses it as impractical, a move that I'm a little bit ambivalent about, as I also think it might be impractical to shift entirely to a pasture ruminant model. We have a lot of people to feed, and to the extent that we don't have food shortages in this world, it's because we're relying on large-scale industrial agricultural models. It's also notable that hunting wild game gets mentioned by Davis as a possible thing to entertain, but he notes that this wouldn't be a sustainable practice for everybody given the human population and most humans' access to wild game. So there's definitely some suspicious stuff going on here, but nonetheless, a compelling argument made here by Davis. There is one other route out of this argument that he's making, and he gives a nod to it at the end of his essay. This concerns this question of whether or not it matters if the animal deaths that are caused by plant agriculture are intentional or not. We might remember this from back when we read Peter Wentz on environmental racism. He called this the doctrine of double effect, in which we say that we're not morally culpable, or certainly not as morally culpable, for something that is um, not an intentional consequence of our action if it's something that's just a byproduct. As I recall, that didn't really find a very warm reception in our class, and most people seem to think that if you knew, if those consequences were predictable, it didn't matter if they weren't intentional. It only matters that they happened and could have been prevented by you. So I think we've got a lot to think about and discuss here, um, some significant challenges to a lot of basic intuitions that we have about the way that our obligations towards animals affect the decisions that we make when we decide what we're going to eat. Um, we had a lot of really great questions on the focus uh, discussion board, uh, as usual, and here's my uh, kind of condensed version of what I think those questions were getting at. The first question is the one that we just saw. It's that question of whether or not it matters that we're not killing these animals of the field intentionally when, uh, when we're practicing uh, plant agriculture. Uh, this essentially this question of whether or not the doctrine of double effect can get us out of the argument that Davis is making. The second question has to do with whether or not the animals of the field are really on equal moral footing with the animals of the farm. It does seem like maybe at the very least we have an intuition, or most people might have an intuition, that a cow is more valuable than a mouse. Um, but why is that? If it turns out that we do empathize more readily with a cow than a mouse, is that speciesist? Are they both equally subjects of a life, or is there an important non-sentimental disinterested objective difference between those two kinds of animals. Number three is that question of uh, what is it that we ought to do with farm animals if we don't eat them? Presumably we should stop uh, stop you know uh, causing them to reproduce and stop making more farm animals if we're not ready to care for them, but if we decided to abolish 
animal agriculture today, what, what should we do with all those animals? And number four, which I thought was a really interesting question, I think it perhaps is more about uh, obligations to humans than obligations to animals, but it's a place where they might intersect. It's this uh, question of, if we were to shift mostly from factory farmed meat to an all so-called humane meat, as if there was such a thing as eating animals the nice way, or maybe eating animals the nicer way, it's undeniable that this would improve the lives of the animals that are involved in animal agriculture, but in addition to that, it would also reduce the number of animals that were killed, as that's a way more expensive way to produce meat, and uh, meat would then become a luxury item that isn't purchased as often. Um, and while this seems good for the animals, it does seem like maybe it means that meat is only available to the wealthy, but not really as available to the poor. Um, does that introduce an injustice amongst humans? Is there a tension at work there? Um, look forward to hearing what you guys think about these questions, um, or if you have any other questions, and uh, I uh, hope everybody's doing well.